Good morning, church. Much better. A pastor decided to skip church one Sunday and go play golf. He called his associate pastor going, I don't feel so good. You're going to have to cover for me. And then he drove to a golf course in another city where no one would know him. He got to the golf course. He got out his clubs, got to the first hole. He teed off. He hit a good shot, and then all of a sudden, this gust of wind kicked up, carried his ball an extra 100 yards, and dropped it right in the hole for a 450-foot hole-in-one. An angel looked at God and said, why did you do that? God smiled and looked at the angel and said, who's he going to tell? So we're very glad that Pastor Tim decided not to play hooky this morning. We're glad that you didn't decide to play hooky as well. Whether you're here in person or watching online, uh, we're glad that you're here and worshiping with us. If you're visiting with us today, we're especially glad to have you. We do have visitor cards in each of our foyer areas where our offering boxes are located. Uh, we would ask if you wouldn't mind just taking one of these and giving us a little information about yourself. If you'd like to share your email address with us. Uh, we can send you some information about our church and other ongoings that we have uh, on Sunday as well as during the week that you can gather in worship opportunities and small groups. And Tim can also send you devotionals uh, that we send out via email each week as well. Um, by way of announcement, I uh, want to share with you uh, our dear sister Maria Hinojosa passed away peacefully in her sleep uh, on Wednesday, June the 8th around 8 p.m. Uh, today, there will be a visitation um, for Maria at Ebensberger Fisher Funeral Home on 111 Rosewood here in Bernie from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, the funeral service will take place this Monday, June 13th at 10 a.m. at the St. Peter the Apostle Catholic Church, which is on 202 West Kronkowski Street. Uh, following that, there will be a gravesite service at 11.30 a.m., at Mission Park uh, Funeral Chapels and Cemetery uh, in the Dominion. Uh, so we all uh, represent and, and will be in prayer as well as presence with Jesse uh, and the Hinojosa family uh, during this time. Uh, also wanted to make note that the baby bottle boomerang, uh, which has been going on for several weeks now, will come to a conclusion uh, next Sunday on Father's Day. So if you still have baby bottles to return with money, coins, bills, checks, uh, whatever you would have to put in there, we ask that you bring those back by next Sunday uh, so that we can collect those and get those uh, proceeds to the Hill Country Pregnancy Care Center uh, where they can use those monies to benefit uh, those that uh, we continue to support year-round. Uh, also, uh, joyful giving. Uh, we appreciate all that you're doing and giving, whether it be online or by sending it in. We do have boxes in each of the four-year areas. We, again, thank you for your faithful giving so we can support ministries like Hill Country Pregnancy Center as well as other missions throughout the world. As we move into our time of communion, on April 21st, 2008, Catherine Wolf suffered a massive stroke at the age of 26. She lost her ability to walk. Speaking became quite difficult and, and hard to decipher, and she could no longer care for herself. Catherine went from a California model to a wheelchair-bound patient and God stepped in. In her wonderful book, Hope Heals, Catherine writes, and I want to quote, I felt a deep awakening of the word of God, which I had known since I was a little girl. It was my epiphany of hope. I would never lose heart in this situation because my soul was not what was wasting away. Let me read that last sentence again. I would never lose heart in this situation because my soul was not what was wasting away. As we come to this table of communion, there are some here today that are in a storm or a season of a storm of life. If you're not there now, 
you once were going through a storm, or if you haven't, there will be one in the future. But I think it's important to remember that through the finished work of Jesus, we are reconciled to him, and we are never alone. He is still the great I am. And so when you find yourself praying, who is it that is going to come and help me? I urge you to listen for the response of Jesus. I am with you in the storm. Yes, our bodies are going to waste away. But because of the blood of Jesus, our spirit will remain pristine. And we, mem we remember that now in a tangible way as we come to the table. It was on that day that Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, and he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. Take and eat. And as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Jesus then took the cup. And he said, this wine represents my blood that will be shed for you for forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink, and as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. And all God's children said, so be it. Well, good morning, everyone. I um, know it's summer, huh? Because like people are disappearing just out of thin air. Um, I don't know how anyone could afford to travel anywhere this summer. <laughs> Vanessa and I went up to the Mayo Clinic and we looked at about flying, but it was like out outrageous to buy a ticket, and so we um, we drove. And in one week, gas prices went up like 15 cents a gallon. And I was like, wow. Uh, nobody's going to be able to miss church this summer because... <laughs> and I really want to thank Pastor Richie because I didn't know that I could call Sunday morning and pretend to be <laughs> sick just to go golfing. But I'm going to be working on it. <clears throat> if you don't see me all of a sudden, I'm not here, you'll be like, oh. Feel good. I'm like, I definitely would do that. Absolutely. Um, I know that everybody wants a kind of an update from our trip to see the doctors at Mayo Clinic. And, um, you know, I, I guess all in all, good, good news is that um, uh, it can be all, everything's being managed in the sense of, you know, I think I always go and I have this expectation that oh, there's going to be a new treatment, a new pill, and you take this, or you have this, and then everything's all better, and you don't have any more problems. Um, but that's not how it works. And um, the doctor, the, um, the Parkinson's specialist said that I was doing uh, really good, but that I was at this phase where the disease is progressing, and so, you know, you have to constantly keep up with the medications to keep up with the decline in the disease. So two medications got uh, double dosed, and then another one went from eight tablets a day to 10 tablets a day, and then they added another medication to deal with the side effects of one of the other medications and uh, suggested another medication. I'm saying, enough. I'm like, how much of this stuff can you take? He goes, oh, no, no problem. You can take this every two hours, and eventually I'll just put a pump in you. And, and I'm like, great news. But he was very positive. I think he even uh, referred to me as one of his best patients. But there was also a very negative side effect. He said I could no longer have two glasses of red wine at night. He said, you can only have a half a glass. And I was really depressed about that. And I called my son, Ryan, and I said, Ryan, this is bad news. He goes, don't worry, Dad, I've got it covered. I'll go get you a new glass. <laughs> so, you know, nothing to worry about, right? 
Remember, I took my mom, Vanessa, and I took my mom when we were living in Hawaii to, to the doctor, and the sweetest doctor, and uh, we're kind of standing out in the hallway, and she's like, well, tell me about your, your, you know, your alcohol consumption. And my mom goes, I have a glass of white wine every day. Yeah. And uh, so they come out, and my mom comes out, and I go, Mom, you lie. My mom's like, I did not lie. I go, Mom, one glass of wine? She goes, I only use one glass. <laughs> so I'm thinking that, you know, I'm going to work this for something. So anyways, uh, don't be counting my glasses, you know. There's, I'm only using one. I'm going to draw a line around it, half, uh, even if it is a 32-ounce glass. So... <laughs> Whatever, we're going to all die of something, right? Might as well go happy. Um, I was pleasantly surprised when my friend uh, walked in the door this morning from Thailand. Um, David Long and I have been friends for uh, like 1988, 89, something like that, right? So a long time. Uh, we were both young then. And um, he was younger, um, but um, we we're so glad that he and his wife and their two kids were able to come visit us. They uh, just moved back so that the kids could um, have some different education opportunities here in the United States. Um, they moved from Bangkok to San Antonio, which yesterday was very similar in weather, 105 and 92 percent humidity. So. The kids are like, are, is this America or, you know, but um, we're glad to have them um, with us. And it was just um, a joy to, to catch up um, a little bit after not seeing each other for several years. So we're going through um, John's first epistle and we're discovering uh, the depth of what we call the gospel, the good news. Now, when I was introduced to what I thought was the gospel, it was very limited because it was really like, um, hey, do you want to go to hell? I'm like, no. Well, then pray this prayer. And then you can be forgiven and go to heaven when you die. Which, like, if you knew me, then you'd be saying, well, that's pretty good news. And I'm not saying that's not good news. I'm just saying it's not really the full gospel. Because what Jesus has done for us, presented by John, is so much fuller that he came to set us free from both the penalty and the power of sin so that he became sin for us. So he died as us. He died for us so that he could remove the penalty to purify, sanctify us so he could put his life in us and then live his life through us and then the end result is we get to go to heaven when we die but don't think of the gospel as just something that happens in the future think of it as this is my present reality not heaven when my physical body gives out but heaven or eternal life living in me now Freedom from the penalty and the power of sin. Freedom from the guilt and shame that all of my bad decisions and destructive behaviors had brought on my life. Freedom from all of those things. So to be born again was to receive a new nature. To become a new person in Christ. And so now we're called saints. Now, I know for a lot of us, like growing up Catholic, we had this idea that saints were people you didn't really want to be because they would make a stone statue out of you, and you were somebody who could, like, really had your act together. And Delaine, thank you, because I didn't know I was supposed to be putting on mascara. <laughs> I'm learning new things all the time. So someone's going to have to... Never mind. Um... You see, but it is true. We do think we have to have our act together, and we think a saint is somehow someone 
who had their act together, was able to make all of the, the right choices to get themselves better than everyone else. And now we look up to these people because they're the saints. And hopefully, with enough effort and determination and willpower, we could, too, climb that ladder to be like them. And see, this is the problem that almost all of us face is that we, especially we Americans, we come in and we got the life and then we're climbing the ladder only to find out that it's leaning against the wrong building. Only to realize that the ladder isn't what we climb up, what Jesus descended to meet us in our needs. And so as we abide in him and he abides in us, then we live and express the righteousness that we are. So the foundation always is, first, I'm the beloved of God. I'm righteous. I'm a saint. Now, it's always important, and the reason I teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, in a very speedy, efficient way, is... <laughs> sorry. Um is so that you always know the context of the foundation. Because I spent a lot of my Christian life where we go to church and a pastor would pick out, you know, he'd pluck two verses out and then he'd use it to beat us up. But I want you to understand the context. And so that's why I'm going to remind you. What did he say? For what did he do and establish for us just as we were talking about two weeks ago? I'm righteous. Now we use it as illustration. So I, I can't remember who I was picking on that day. I think it was Johnny, right? Yeah, so I said, um, how many of you here in second service are as righteous as Johnny? And like, you know, half the crowd's like, well, yeah. <laughs> a guy from Washington with a Mickey Mouse tattoo? Well, you know, I mean, raise the standard a little bit. And so we're like, yeah, well, you know, yeah, I'm probably righteous as Johnny. You know, he's a drummer. I mean, what's he got going for him, right? And then we would say, well, who's as righteous as the Apostle Paul? And we're all like, oh, no way, man. That guy gave everything. And then we're like, how? Well, who's righteous? And I think three people raised their hand. And then I say, well, who's as righteous as Jesus Christ? And the same three people raised their hands. And I go, see, after listening to me for 10 years, three people got it. Because still in our framework, we think that being a saint, being righteous, being accepted, being loved is somehow the fruit of what we've been able to achieve. Because we sit there and just like all religions, we, we get religion and whatever the religion is, it says, okay, here's the system of self-improvement. Here's a system of how we become good. And the good news isn't how you become good. The good news is how Jesus, who is good, does everything that was necessary to transform you and make you righteous, make you holy, because you are his beloved. So we need to live moment by moment, the very beginning point, before we address any of the other things is, I'm beloved. So who's beloved? Oh, come on, let's have some... Do you guys want to be here at 1230? Let's just settle it. Hey, I don't know who did it. I don't know who did it. But someone moved my bottle of water and my Bible to an unknown location. And you mistakenly thought that if I didn't have my notes, it would be a short message. <laughs> my friend Brian Thomas, who preached last week, I'm talking to Brian. I said, man, that was great. I got to watch the first service in the hotel room before we took off for the day. And Brian goes, man, you guys, he goes, I really apologize. I, I preached pretty short, and I hope people weren't disappointed. I said, Brian, wrong church. I said, Brian, I, I, whenever I'm gone, they're going to want you to come and no one else. This is not the group. This is like, how fast can we get out of here group? But at his church, you got to preach 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, because people come to get something. But anyways. Now, who in here is loved, genuinely loved? 
And who in here is genuinely righteous? Because if you're loved and in Christ, you're loved and you're righteous. And you've been made holy. You've been set apart to God. This isn't something you do through self-determination, through effort, by just grit and will. This is what he does to you. This is what he does for you. And it's a gift that we receive. He transforms me. So he starts off here in verse number eight. Let's cover two whole verses today. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Father, I just pray that our hearts would be receptive, and I pray that you could freely speak through me, and that you could freely speak into the hearts of your beloved, and remove confusion and doubt and just um, like speak deeply and powerfully open our eyes to see we pray in jesus name amen so he says whoever makes a practice of sinning is the, the of the devil now if you start here separated from the context you're going to say wow he's going to beat us up but he he's already established he says listen there there's two groups of people he goes, you can't help but practice righteousness because you are righteous. The, the reason we practice righteousness is we've gotten a new righteous nature, and righteousness is the only thing that makes sense for us. Now, he doesn't say that you cannot sin. He, can, he doesn't say you will never have a bad attitude, a bad day, a bad action. He doesn't say any of that. He says that now that you have a new nature, you have a new way of living because I came to be your life. When you were born into the world, you were born into the world and you sinned. Now, this is the beautiful thing, right? Uh, I think Randy and Sally, they got a brand new baby, you know, and, and Sally went right up to be with the daughter, and Randy was still here. And I said, Randy, why didn't you run up there to be with the, that new little born? He smiled, and I smiled, and I said, I wouldn't have gone either. <laughs> you know, the thing about kids is they are the most selfish, self-absorbed beings on the planet what you guys are looking at me like i'm a horrible person i'm telling the truth have you ever seen a newborn that doesn't instantly demand what they want and if they don't get it when they want it they instantly start crying so they want to eat and then they want to poop and they want to be clean i mean it's all about me from the beginning so then what happens is we grow up and we mature and we modify our screaming in a limited way, but it's still all about us. And you know why? Because we were born sinners. We were born kind of geared around self-centered, self-absorbed, I want what I want, right? You know, like even when I get the baby and I have her and I'm like, I know what I want and I know what I want and I want it now. You know, I mean, like, that's it. And really, even though you know, we're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80. Nothing's really changed. We just modify how we scream. And therein lies the problem. He says, you see, that's the, that's the problem. He says, but, but he says, now, when you're born of God, then all of that changes because you have a new nature. Whoever makes a practice, and this practice is, means like a continuous tense, ongoing. It means a lifestyle of sin. He says, it's very simple. Uh, they're, they're doing this because they're still of their father, the devil. They're just doing what their father showed them to do. Uh, they have a fallen nature. Now, it isn't that Jesus didn't die for them to erase all that they were in Adam, but they had refused to receive it. They, there uh, were, were those in the church who John realized had not truly come in brokenness and confessed their sinfulness and their inability to transform themselves and realize their need for a Savior and yet to be born again. He said, they're in the church, they're amongst us. 
That's why back in John 8, 44, he said, uh, you are of your father, the devil. Like this guy obviously had not read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I mean, this isn't just like how you start a conversation. Like you walk up to him, you say, you are obviously of your father, the devil. Like you might get punched today, right? But he's saying, listen, and you do your father's desires, he was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, where was, where was Jesus preaching this? Well, he was obviously, he had gone to a brothel to, to preach to the prostitutes this message. He went down to the corner bar where it was really dark, and that's where he preached this message. No, he went to church. Are you hearing me? Because see, we like to separate and identify certain sins as bad sins, and our sins are good sins. Or at least not as bad as other people's. But Jesus was speaking this to very religious people who didn't realize their need for a Savior, who were very proud of their self reliance and their self-righteousness and we forget that it is the very act of pride which comes so naturally to us that puts us in opposition to God and so John says listen your lifestyle if your your lifestyle is a lifestyle of sin it's because you're still identified with your father a sinner a deceiver, the one of darkness. Now think about how our culture has been kind of captivated by this idea that people will say about their sin, oh, that's my lifestyle. And the one I always like is, I was born this way. Now, very religious people get upset about that. And I've had discussions with people, even in our church, and they'll say, they were not born like that. And I go, what do you mean they weren't born like that? Yes, they were. They were all born sinners. I mean, that's not your sin. But if they were all born sinners, they were all born with some propensity to something self-destructive. And what you chose as self-destructive, and they chose maybe completely different, but yeah, we were all born. So the church world shouldn't look out at the world, uh, the unbelieving world, and be surprised that it sins and chooses it and wants us to celebrate it. But what we need to do is say, if that's your lifestyle, you're still living the lifestyle that is in harmony with your, the enemy of your soul because it leads to destruction. When we think of devil, we're thinking of darkness, we're thinking of Satan as an individual, the opposite opposite to God, the one who put himself in opposition to him. But you got to remember, man, the devil goes to church because he doesn't care how he holds you captive as long as he can hold you captive. He doesn't care if he can captivate you by drugs, alcohol, sex, or he can hold you captive by self-righteous religious function. He don't care because his whole purpose is holding you captive. And the one is much more subtle than the other because the devil is the source of sin and behind all the evil that we're facing today is an evil being. I mean, you just, you know, like think about what's been happening even in our own area over the last couple of weeks. I mean, it's evil. There's a source of evil that promulgates this, that makes us seem acceptable and, going, and, and we shouldn't be shocked because there is a source of evil. And if we don't recognize it, that there's a spiritual battle taking place, we're going to be constantly uh, flooded with conflict and, 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 and confusion because we're like, well, what's the thing? But, 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 but there is evil out there. And when someone surrenders to be an instrument of evil, it's going to bring destruction and chaos. The answer to evil, though, is never more evil. The answer to the flesh is never more flesh. 
but we recognize it. And there's a hard part because we think, well, you know, on one side there's, you know, people who love Jesus and really want to follow him. And then there's these other people who are just, you know, they're, they're followers of Satan and, and just self-pursuing life. And then there's this big group in the middle. But what he's trying to get us to say is that, you know, mankind can't be neutral. You belong to one side or the other. And John wants them to, is doing his best to make it absolutely clear that the person who fails to do righteousness doesn't belong to God because there's no, there's no amount of doing righteousness that can make us righteous. See, you understand this? Like, like I've been all over the world, right? I mean, like I've been in Hindu countries and Buddhist countries and worked with Muslims. It doesn't matter. I've seen a lot of people from different religions. They can do good things. And a lot of the systems are about doing good things. But doing 10 good things can't erase 10 bad things. Doing 10 good things can't erase even one bad thing. He's saying to us, like, listen, we need someone to save us. There's no self-improvement. There's no amount of doing good. Though doing good, doing righteous deeds should be the outflow of knowing I'm righteous. Because nothing else makes sense. It's like what we were talking about a few weeks ago. I'm like, if you go on with this mantra, well, all I am is a sinner, but I'm saved by grace, well, then you can't expect yourself to do anything but continue in sin because that's what you've taken as your identity. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Take as your identity, man. I'm the beloved of God. Hey, I'm righteous. And this attitude that is not righteous, that don't fit me anymore. This action that action is not righteous. It doesn't suit who he made me to be. He says, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So from the beginning of time, God does all of this creation. He didn't create the devil as an evil, malevolent being. The devil chose, chose to take this path of rebellion. He created him to be a force of good, a force of worship, a force to bring glory and intelligence. And just like man, he had a choice. We choose. He chose self-pride and charged, uh, changed the angel God had created him to be into what we call the devil, the force of evil. Now, I want you to read this because I was like reading this and I've, I've read all these passages over the years, you know, I don't know, lots of times. But God gave me something the other day that just changed it all for me, okay? And I'm glad you're here because I'm really excited about sharing this with you. I'm not sure you're going to be excited, but I'm excited. So Isaiah 14, he has three verses here, and he describes who the devil is, okay? He says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground who laid the nations low. You said in your heart. Now, I want you to catch this subtlety, Okay. Oh, just answer. It'll be fine. I can wait. <laughs> um, he said, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself the most high. So what do you see here? In the description of what we call the devil, what do we see five times? I will. And so I was thinking about this and I was meditating on it. And I was like, ooh. You know, like when the spirit kind of gives you that jolt and all of a sudden you're like, uh. The revelation that came to my mind was all of a sudden this. This is how I know when I'm walking in the influence of Satan and when I'm walking in the influence of the spirit of God. And it's all this. I will or not my will, yours. 
Jesus comes, he takes on human flesh, he shows his miraculous hand, his deliverance, his care for the poor, the sick, the broken, everyone who had messed up their lives, he's going and he's reaching, all the people, the religious people who didn't want to be around. I remember reading this last week, I was like, there was this one story in the gospel, and the Pharisees are sitting over there, and they're like, if, if he knew what kind of woman that was, he wouldn't let her be touching him. If he was a real prophet, a real religious person influenced by Satan. Do you see what I'm saying here? See, whenever I say I will, I have subtly come under the influence and direction of the enemy. No matter how you rationalize it, no matter how you justify it, without ever like knowing even what's going on, you say, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. We're under the wrong influence. Now, I understand that this is the very core of the American life. Because what do we do? We say, you know what? I want to go here, and so what do we do? We go. And I want to do this, and so what do we do? We do that. And I want to spend money here, and what do we do? We spend that. What do we do? A whole sum of our lives is all about I will. Now, here's the only little problem in this, is you get married. I'm telling you. Whenever I'm doing premarital counseling, Katie's always like, Dad, it sounds like you're talking. I'm out of it. I go, I am. If you're going to be, I will. So what I discovered is that I will, and life would be perfect if my sweet wife would finally come to the grips that the only thing that really matters is I will. Come on, say amen. Well, can't anybody track with me? And you know what? The problem with that is she has a I will. And at the core of every relationship, whether it's a marriage or a family or a working relationship, as believers, as long as we're asserting, I will, I will, I will, there is always going to be disharmony, dysfunction, and heartache. Now, the, the, the issue, because we think, well, someone's will has to triumph over the other one, or there won't be peace. No. You see, the, the, the true understanding of the gospel is not my will over their will or their will over my will. The, the true understanding of the transformation of the gospel is not my will, yours. Jesus had done all of these things. And he comes into the garden understanding that before him is the cross, the terror, the torture, the humiliation to be stripped naked and to be whipped and to be nailed to the cross and to suffer the experience of separation and to give it all up. And he says, Abba, is there another way? Could you take this cup from me? But not my will, yours. But not my will, yours. But not my will, yours. And all of a sudden, Jesus is showing us that the path to Victory, the path to love, the path to joy is not asserting my will, but saying, not my will. Not independence, but absolute dependence upon him. You see, this was what the devil has always been doing. At the very beginning, you got everything perfect, right? Right? Perfection, Garden of Eden, no illness, all the everything is there, perfect. And he comes and he says, Hey guys, God's holding out on you. And there's this tree over here, and God told you not to eat. He said, Don't eat of that tree because that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know what? You could be like God, knowing 
good and evil. And they looked at that thing and they said, wow, you know, that, that looks pretty good. I mean, I'd be like God. And they ate and destruction came into their experience. So what we do in one form or another is then we get religion and in my case, you know, I, I prayed the prayer so I didn't go to the fiery hell. I got my fire insurance. I'm going to heaven when I die. And now I get in the religious system that worked really hard to get me from the evil side of the tree to the good side of the tree. And in my case, there was a lot of movement that needed to take place. And so, man, they came down on me, man. Quit drinking, quit smoking, quit dancing, quit going to those horrible Hollywood motion picture shows. Just go to Blockbuster where no one knows what you're watching. And then, um, I mean, we had a lot of inconsistency in our rules, but uh, and we had all kinds of things, man. You couldn't dance because we were Baptists and Baptist feet don't dance. And um, so Pentecostals, that was great because, man, you could start dancing again. Anyway, we came up with all kinds of rules and regulations, you know, uh, and, and we got everybody from the evil side of the tree over to the good side of the tree where you went to church three to thrive Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, three, three to thrive. The only way you could be a good Christian is you had to go to church three times. And you had to tithe. You had to tithe. And then you had to give your offerings. And then you had to give your sacrifices. And okay, you're over here and you got that going and you, you're good to go. You're on that good side of the tree and, and uh, you know, whatever. There was always something more you had to do to be on the good side of the tree. And the good Christians were more on the good side of the tree than the evil side of the tree. Only for me to discover that's the wrong tree. I was never designed to eat from that tree because I was never designed to be God. And as awesome as you are, you are neither. You were designed to eat from the tree of life, which is the indwelling source of God where he comes to live in you. Look, he says, for the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. We saw it a couple weeks ago, right? He's saying, listen, the devil can't make you do it. The devil has lost all power, all of darkness, however you want to conceive of the devil or Satan of every malevolent factor out there, you are no longer under its authority, its influence, or its power. Why? Because Christ came to deliver you from the self-life, from the I will. And this is the ever-growing experience of our transformation, to recognize that sin is a defeated foe. Listen, there will never be a point in your life, I think, that you're not going to be tempted. My experience is that my temptations change over the years. Like, over the decades, they just kind of change because my capacity to act is diminished. You know what I mean? Honestly, I just don't have that much energy anymore. You know, like someone said, hey, Tim, let's go run over there. I'm like, I ain't running nowhere. You know, this is going to have to be a very low energy, you know, function. But the temptation is always there. The temptation is always there to try and assert myself, to seek my own needs, my own desires, my I, my I want, my I will, in one way or the other. But the key is to recognize, I'm free from that. I have something better. The key is to recognize, he's defeated. It has no power. That Jesus came and took my guilt and my shame and the power that used to hold me, and he set me free. In Colossians 2.15, he says he disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he, he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. That what Christ did defeated the enemy in every way. He's vanquished. And so then he comes back and he says, and no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. 
He says to be born of God, to receive the life of God, changes the nature so that your lifestyle is no longer the practice of sinning. Now, if you, if you come at this all wrong, like for a, a religious lens, you're, you're really even going to understand, misunderstand what sin is. Because I don't, I don't care if I was in a Pentecostal church or a Baptist church. We all had our ideas of what sin was. And if you, when we were in the Baptist church, being a Pentecostal, that was sin. And uh, when we were in the Pentecostal church, being a Baptist, that was sin. And, you know, I mean, there were stuff like that, right? But sinning at its core is the prohibition that God places on our lives to protect us from us. It's anything that acts in self-will and brings destruction to us and to his kingdom. God doesn't just sit back there and go, well, let me think of some rules so I can make these people miserable. That's what parents do. God sits there and goes, what is harmful to my children? It's prohibited. Why? Because he only wants what's good for us. Why? Because we're beloved. Why? Because we're righteous. And he says, so to be born of God, to have a new nature, is to have a new practice or a new lifestyle, even though we may be tempted. He says, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. So he says, all of a sudden, God takes us, and he plants his seed, his own life in us. So God made us three parts, right? We have a body, and this body is messed up. It is in decline. It is decaying. No, I mean, your, your body's wearing out. Now, some of you youngsters, you think, oh, what's he talking about? Well, you just talk to me in a few years. Right? I mean, it used to be I got sick every 10 years, and then it was every year, and now I'm looking for the week where I'm not. Like, this is what the body does. It perishes. Now, he makes a, a physical body, and he gives us a soul which is our thinker, feeler, our chooser, our mind, will, and emotions. And those all make up kind of like what we think of as our personality, how we think, how we feel, how we choose. And he saves our soul from being self-willed, but he does something even different because what makes us unique as humans as opposed to animals is that we have a full functioning soul, but we also have a spirit. We have a consciousness that no evolutionary biologist can really explain. We have a consciousness that is made alive to God so that when we entrust ourselves to God, we receive him to be our Savior, Lord, and life. All of a sudden, we have a new consciousness, a new awareness that makes us different than everything else. And where we used to hear things about the Scripture or read things in the Scripture that didn't make any sense to us, all of a sudden, the light comes on, the veil's been lifted, and we're like, wow, that makes sense. That resonates in my spirit. I get it. And so what he's saying to you is, remember at the core, you have a body, right? And your soul lives in your body, but you're a spirit being. And he brings that. He says to be born of God is to receive the seed of him. And he says when that happens, you can't keep on in a lifestyle of sinning because you have new desires. Now, religion tries to get you to change your desires, but the key thing is going, no, he gave me new desires. He gives me new desires. Now, we talked about it before, the goofy illustration, but I like it. If my dog comes up to me and goes, meow, and my dog's weird, okay? So it's not impossible to think. What are we going to do? Are we going to say, Finnegan, you're a cat now? No, we're going to say, Finnegan, that was freaky. Don't do it again. 
You see the see how subtle Satan is? He says, well, if I can get you to meow, I can get you to believe that you are what you feel. This is invading our whole society. You are what you feel. No, you are not. You are being a freak of nature. Now, I'm not trying to be mean because you know what? There are times when I'm just a freak. When my attitudes, actions, they just don't align up with what Jesus says I am. Now, I know that none of you ever have these experiences, so just sit there and look with judgment on me, but I'm willing to own it. There are times I'm just a little freaky. And God speaks to me and says, you know what? That doesn't fit you. That needs to be taken off. Because all through life, life is this journey where we go through these events and times where we, we just, we get, our, our feeler can get stuck. And if you let your feeler dominate who you are, man, you're in trouble. That's why the Bible never tells you how to feel. It always tells you how to think. It's not that your feelings aren't valid and important. They are, but they're not meant to be the, the force of your chooser. And so when I let my feeler get out of whack and I start making choices that don't line up with who I am, I, all of a sudden the Spirit's got to invade there and say, that needs to be put off. That's not who you are. You have the seed of God living in you. You're the beloved of God. You're righteous and holy. And that doesn't look, sound, or act righteous and holy. So put it off. You have the seed of life. You've become a partaker of the divine nature. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 is a verse that I've shared with you before. And quite honestly, I, I, I'm going to put this in lots of my messages in the weeks to come. And you say, well, why would you repeat it so much? Because I, I think if I repeat it over and over and over again, there's a slight chance you'll get it. You know what I'm saying? Because it's so contrary to what we think. You know what I mean? Like, when the scripture says something and it seems different than our experience, well, then it's easy to go default to the old operating system. That's why I hate updates on my phone. You know what I mean? It, am I the only one? Just leave good enough alone. Then they'll change the whole operating system and now I can't find anything. It takes me three weeks, three months, have my grandchildren help me figure it all out, and then they update it again. But see, when I was born, I was born with an operating system that was all about I will, 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 and if I don't, I'm going to cry, have a fit, temper tantrum, make whatever. And then I get a new operating system that's all about the divine life in me that says, not my will, yours, not my will, yours. But there are many times when I can go back to my old operating system and try to function out of getting my needs met by doing what I want. And he's saying, it's not there. Because what? By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Now, John, pay attention. Don't go home and tell Delane, pastor told me, that I'm divine, and you need to appreciate it. Because you never know what someone's going to take from your message. I don't think she'd buy it anyways, but, you know, it's worth a try, John. Here you go. I am not divine. I have participated, partook of the nature of God through the Spirit who now lives in me so that I am no longer dependent upon my own resources for anything I'm facing. So no matter what I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with Parkinson's and I'm not dependent upon myself to function and to make life work. I'm dependent of the divine nature that is in me to be expressed 
through me. You're going through a divorce or you're going through a business failure. You're going through, you know, heartache and a family. No matter what you're facing, what storm as in your life. And like Pastor Richie was talking about it. And I'm like, yep, you either just came out of a storm. You're in the midst of a storm or you're going into a storm. This is life. But he said, you don't have to do it in your own power because you've become a partaker. You have this very great and precious promise, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not when you die and go to heaven today and everything that you face. Because you, my friends, he says, have escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Now, no one in here has any remaining sinful desires, but a lot of people who watch online do. <laughs> so I need to address this so you guys just kind of bear with me, okay? Do you see what he says the sinful desires are? It's corruption. You see, the I will, I will, I will, I will, I will is sourced in the devil who has what we call sinful desires. And we don't think of it. We just think, well, I just want to do that, or I just want to go there, and I just want to have that, because we think those are the things that are going to make me full, complete, and happy and content. But he says, you know what they really do? They bring corruption. And he goes, you've been delivered from all of that. Will you be tempted? Sure. But you're delivered. You have a great precious promise that Christ lives in you. So in all the different denominational arguments that go around, people are always want to know, well, can you lose your salvation? And they want to have this big debate. And I'm like, hey, listen, if you're the source of your salvation, you're in trouble. I'm in trouble. But if you were birthed by God... If Jesus was your birthing person, well, I'm not a biologist, so I can't tell you what a woman is. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> inappropriate. Um, if Jesus was your birthing person, if he birthed into your spiritual life, it is a gift that you receive, not something you achieve. No kid comes out of the womb and says, whoa, look at the job I just did. No. I mean, the, the, the mom, the birthing person, the woman goes through this incredible, torturous pain and gives life to this child. And like, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I'm like, that would only happen once. I mean, one time, never again. And then the wife's like, I just want another baby. And I'm like, I should have had video of that because that didn't look like something you want to do twice or four times. But what is it? The power of bringing life overcomes all of the heartache. And Jesus, the scripture says, endured the cross. Not because it was pleasurable. Because it allowed him to birth into you and I eternal life now. He says, 1 Peter 1, he says, because he has been born of God. That's what it is. To be born of flesh. To be born of the spirit. To know that I'm alive. And 1 Peter 1, 23 says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living, abiding word of God. And when we see this living, abiding word of God, we're not talking about a book or a translation. We're talking about the logos. Christ himself. And he says, hey, that attitude... It's got to go. That doesn't suit you. And I love that God is so patient and enduring. 
I've been working on my next series, which I will warn you will also be quite brief through the book of Galatians, probably about 10 months. And I got through chapter number five, and I was looking at the fruit of the Spirit, so the works of the flesh and, and the fruit of the Spirit. And in the old translation, they say long-suffering, but in the modern translation, it says patience. And I thought, how cool is it that God is long-suffering? that he works with us from the minute we're born unto him until this perishable takes on imperishable, transforming us, bringing us, showing what still needs to be shed. To be born of God says, listen, I'm free from the habitual sin because God lives in me. And we can all establish really deeply ingrained flesh patterns, like this is how we respond and we react to things, and then we start making excuses for it and justifying it. And, you know, I've joked about it before. Well, that's just the way I am, and you're going to have to learn to live with it. God never says that. God says, you know what? This may take some work, and it might be painful rehab, but I'm long in suffering. So the question is always comes back to, like, have you truly been born of God? Say, Lord, I, I can't fix myself. Would you bring your life into me? I believe that when you went to that cross, you became what I was, a sinner. You became sin so that I might be made righteous. And you, you were buried. And when you were buried, you took all of my sin, all of my guilt, all of my shame, and you left it in the grave. And you raised again on the third day to give me newness of life. So you say, okay, well, Pastor, uh, that's good, but what do I got to do and how much does it cost? It costs everything, and it costs nothing. You have to say, Lord, I am not my own. I can't do it. I receive it. And remember, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil in your life. You are no longer a slave of sin. He can't make you do anything. You've been set free. You have a new owner, a new life. So live true to your true self. And what is the true self? The way you acted last night? Maybe. Maybe not. What's the true self? I'm the beloved of God. What's my true self? I'm righteous. What's my truth, Al? I've been set apart to God. I'm sanctified. I'm his. I am not my own. And when I get all kind of uppity and say, I will, I will, I will, I will, then wake up and remind yourself that is the philosophy of Satan. But when I say, not my will, yours, not my will, yours, not my will, yours. Now I'm liberated to experience what it is to be a vessel that expresses who he is. And in the end, it always looks like Jesus, sounds like Jesus, and acts like Jesus. And everything else, that's got to be cast off. Well, Father, thank you for your wonderful love, and I'm so grateful to you for this opportunity to share. I pray that it would be meaningful and empowering for us as we seek to be a light in a dark place, love amongst hatred, joy and despair, hope in a hopeless world. 
not I will, but your will, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.